Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is a solved one, but the family had a, such a long journey throughout this case and they are still fighting for justice. One of the perpetrators was handed way too light of a sentence and the other one just walked free. And when you hear the details of this case, you will understand why this is just so frustrating. But before we get into today's video, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Liquid IV. Liquid IV is a great tasting electrolyte drink mix that is the perfect way to stay hydrated. I live in Arizona, which is a very dry desert, so I've been using Liquid IV long before they agreed to sponsor today's video. My friends actually swear by Liquid IV and they were so excited when I told them that I have a discount code for them. Drinking one Liquid IV hydration multiplier hydrates you faster and more efficiently than water alone. Liquid IV is powered by cellular transport technology, which is designed to enhance rapid absorption of water and other key ingredients. Plus, they taste amazing. I have their lemon lime flavor, which is my friend's favorite flavor, and then their best-selling flavor, strawberry. I personally love both of these flavors. They definitely pack a punch and they taste amazing. Liquid IV is so easy to pack to use on the go. I always bring some with me when I go on my hiking trips or if I go on any hike in Arizona. It is so important to stay hydrated when you're in Arizona, especially if you're outside or doing a more intensive hike. It definitely helps to have have a liquid IV instead of just water because sometimes water just isn't enough. It's also great for those of you who like to enjoy an alcoholic beverage from time to time, whether you need fast hydration the morning after or you want to stay hydrated all night. These are such an amazing little trick to bring with you if you want to stay healthy and hydrated on your night out. So if you want to try any of their best-selling liquid multiplier flavors, Liquid IV is offering my subscribers 25% off of your order when you use my discount code RACHELSHANNON25. Again, that's RACHELSHANNON25 for 25% off of your Liquid IV order. Thank you again so much to Liquid IV for sponsoring today's video and for supporting my channel. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we will be discussing the murder of Michaela Young. Michaela Young was born June 15, 1997 to her parents, Christy and Michael Young, and she had four siblings, Brittany, Andrew, Emily, and Connor, and she grew up in Spokane, Washington. Her family was known as being very close-knit, and they definitely acted as each other's support systems when they needed it. She had a niece named McKinley who called her Lala. She absolutely adored her niece. She was described as being kind to everybody she met, trustworthy and wanted to make everybody around her feel absolutely loved. Growing up, Michaela was known to be the life of the party. She loved dancing like crazy and wasn't afraid to look silly or funny. She was always able to make her brothers and sisters laugh whenever she got the chance. Every year, the family would go to their cabin in Priest Lake and spend time with their extended family. Michaela was known to put on dance shows for the extended family and never failed to put a smile on everyone's faces. Her family says that Michaela was so outgoing that she would even walk up to strangers and would strike up a conversation. That's just how she was. But at the same time, Michaela was a very, very trusting person, which may have caused some problems for her. Michaela did face her fair share of struggles in the last few years of her life. She had found herself pregnant in 2014, but she actually lost the baby in a miscarriage after 28 weeks, which is just so horrific and something that's so hard to go through. Then she fell pregnant once again in 2018. When she found out she was pregnant, she was so excited, even posting a photo of her sonogram to Instagram with the caption, here's my little babe, saw the little hands and feet moving around like crazy, heartbeat is perfect, and the due date is September 2nd. But unfortunately, she lost her baby late in her pregnancy and this resulted in her having a stillborn, which again is just so devastating and I can't even imagine the heartbreak and frustration. She ended up moving back in with her parents and focused on spending as much time with them as she could. After the second miscarriage, she was really struggling, but through it all, her family was always there to support her and help her through her problems. Her sister Emily once wrote to Facebook, Michaela could take one look at me and know if I was upset about something. If a boyfriend hurt her or I, we would take on and bear each other's pain. If she 
was mad at someone, I was also equally as mad at that person. The reason she always called me her big little sister is because I always felt the need to watch over and protect her. She was always so blind to the evils of this world, manipulative people, or just people who didn't have her best interests at heart. I think a part of that was that she had been through so much, losing two babies among other heartbreaks that only I and people very close to her know. She went through things that nobody should have to experience. She wanted to be loved so badly. She wanted to feel like she had a purpose. The thing is, when you have a heart like Michaela's, you look past certain flaws in people that others wouldn't. I always begged her not to. I begged and begged, but she didn't see what I saw. I reminded her that I loved her so much every day. She truly is my everything. My heart aches as the days slowly pass without her. I know that she wasn't ready to meet our maker. I hate when people say that. She was stolen from us, her future husband, her future children, and her sweet McKinley Sue. Now, in early 2020, Michaela had started dating a 27-year-old man named Anthony Fuerte. The two had been dating only a few weeks, so none of her friends or anyone in her family really knew much about him or his past. However, friends of Michaela who had met Anthony described him as a charismatic guy who seemed like a loving boyfriend. A friend reported that, by all accounts, he seemed like he always treated her well. They didn't really see any red flags. He seemed like he was really interested in getting to know her, being there for her, and helping her through her tough times. However, it would later come out that Anthony was a man who had a lot of difficulties in his life. Anthony was born to his mother when she was only 16 years old and his father who was 24 years old, both of which were heavily involved in drug use. He did have learning disabilities and was later found to have an IQ of 50, which is well below the average. Growing up, he too had fell into drug use. He started using weed by the time he was in eighth grade, and at this time, he had actually been expelled from school for bringing marijuana to school. By the time he hit his teen years, he went on to have two children with a past girlfriend, but according to him, the two of them had co-parented. Then, by the time he was 19 years old, he was convicted of armed robbery. For this, he was sentenced to seven years in prison. While in prison, he was introduced to much harder drugs like meth, so this led him to using these heavy drugs once he left prison. So at the time, I don't know if Michaela's friends or her family had known about all of these past charges, I don't know if they thought that he just seemed like a nice guy or if, you know, they knew about the past charges and maybe thought that he had reformed. I'm not sure, but those around her still said that they didn't have any reason to think that their relationship was anything other than normal. However, everything started to change in early February of 2020. So, on February 6th, Anthony and Michaela had gotten a ride from a friend named Joshua Thomas. While they were driving, the three of them actually got pulled over in a random traffic stop, and during this stop, both Josh and Anthony ended up getting arrested. They had been arrested on an outstanding warrant issued by the Washington Department of Corrections for a parole violation that they had apparently committed. I believe this parole violation was for possession of methamphetamines. Either way, they had been booked into the Yakima County Jail, but they they were released soon after on February 25th, 2020. According to a friend of Michaela's, she did notice a sudden shift in Anthony's behaviors after he got released. She said that Michaela was starting to be afraid that Anthony was going to hurt her because he may have thought that she was the one who like set up this traffic stop and set him up to be arrested. But obviously she had not actually done this, but both Anthony and Joshua had gang affiliations, so she was afraid that somebody was going to come after her. So on the same day that they were released on February February 25th, Anthony had called Michaela to see if she wanted to get together. During the call, Anthony said, now I want to talk to you about what happened that night. So Michaela and a friend had met up with Anthony at a 7-Eleven in downtown Spokane. So they went there to meet up with Anthony and when they got there, they saw that Anthony had another friend named Lionel White who was also at the 7-Eleven. Apparently Lionel White had armed himself with an ax handle for this meeting. Don't know why, don't really know any other details about this. I literally just saw it mentioned in a sentence in one of the articles. But either way, when they met up with Anthony, he gave her a quote, bloody meth needle, and he tried to get her to come to Portland with him. But Michaela's friend just did not have a good feeling about this. 
She was worried that Anthony may have had bad intentions and would harm her if she did go with him. So her friend convinced Michaela to stay with her in Spokane that night. So on that next night on February 26, 2020, Anthony and his friend Lionel had booked themselves a room at the Roadway Inn on Houston Avenue in Spokane. They checked in at 11 p.m. that night and once again, Anthony called Michaela to see if she wanted to come over to talk. Now, usually when they sent messages back and forth, they were usually those lovey-dovey, sweet kind of messages that you send back and forth when you're in the honeymoon phase of a new relationship. However, on this night, he suddenly started messaging her things like, where are you at? Who are you with? Get here now. Meet me in the parking lot. Very dry and unemotional. So Michaela definitely did not have the best feeling going into this. According to a friend, Michaela just knew that he wasn't acting right. He had her meet him in the parking lot and he wouldn't tell her what room they were going into ahead of time. And the room number that they went to was actually reported differently depending on what article you read. So I'm not exactly sure what room they went into either. According to this friend, he had just been acting very sketchy that night. But nonetheless, Michaela did agree to go and meet up with him. She arrived at the Roadway Inn at 1 a.m., now going into February 27th. According to surveillance video from the Roadway Inn, Michaela seemed to be acting pretty normally when she got there. The two had hugged when they saw each other and then walked into the room holding hands. But not long after arriving, Michaela started to feel uneasy. She knew that something was wrong, so she ended up posting a Snapchat story asking around for a ride. However, no one ended up seeing her Snapchat, so she didn't end up getting a ride. Her friend went on to say that she feels really bad because she literally lives right down the street from the Roadway Inn, and if she would have seen that story, she would have given her a ride in a heartbeat, but she just missed the story. Then around the same time at around 1 a.m., again on February 27th, 911 received a phone call from another guest at the Roadway Inn to report that there was a man and a woman having a very loud argument in the room below them. By the time officers got to the room that Michaela and Anthony were in, they saw Lionel walking out of the room. He told the officers that the occupant of the room was still inside and that, you know, there was a woman present, so he was told to leave. So police poked their head into the room, but they didn't see anybody inside. After this, nothing else happened that night. By that next morning, or I guess later that same morning on February 27th at 10.55 a.m., I guess Lionel was back at the hotel room. A housekeeper reported that she had seen Lionel setting bloody towels outside of the hotel room that morning. So she asked him if he needed more towels and he said, yes, he does. So she left, but she did not return back until that next day. So a few hours passed and by 3 p.m. on February 27th, 911 received phone calls from multiple people near the roadway inn reporting that there was a man who was covered in blood who had attempted to carjack multiple people. So it was found that this bloody man who did turn out to be Anthony had attempted to hide inside of a car in the parking lot of a car dealership. Apparently a worker at a nearby Jimmy John's had seen him go inside of the trunk of a Corvette that was parked in the lot. So he went and told the sales rep, Conair Fleck, about this man. When Conair Fleck, the sales rep at the car dealership, went to go check it out, Anthony had jumped out of the trunk, still covered in blood. Then he started running down the street, but according to Conair, he sort of just had a bad feeling about Anthony, so him and another employee chased him down the street. As he was running, he attempted to carjack multiple people. He first ran up to the driver's side of a woman's window and yelled multiple times for her to get out of the car and tried forcibly opening the door, getting a bloody handprint on the door in the process. But thankfully, this woman had her doors locked and she was able to speed away before he got in. He then attempted to carjack another woman who was buckling her kids into the car. He ran up towards the car and she attempted to run around the car on the other side to get into the driver's side, but she did not make it in time. He grabbed her and put his arm around her neck and told her to give him the keys and get her kids out of the car. So she went around to the other side of the car and started to unbuckle her kids as Anthony got into the driver's seat. But as this was happening, Conair and other bystanders ran up and stopped Anthony from stealing her car. They chased Anthony until they reached a wake-up call coffee shop located about two blocks north of the car dealership. When they got there, Anthony tried getting into the wake-up call through a window, but Conair said that he pulled Anthony away from the window and away from the driver who was also at the window. Then the lady who was at the window in her car called police. 
It was at this time that multiple witnesses gathered around to detain Anthony and hold him down until police arrived. Witnesses described just how cool it was to see all of these good Samaritans work together to stop this very clearly crazy and erratic man covered in blood. He was clearly dangerous, but these brave people stopped him from getting away and possibly running away from police. When police finally detained Anthony, he was covered in scratches all over his neck and his legs, and he was acting erratic radically. They ended up taking him to the hospital for a cut that he had on his finger, but police say that the way he was acting was very out of proportion for the injuries that he had sustained. So Anthony did qualify for a mental health examination at this time. It also came out that while at the hospital, Anthony had asked an officer to throw away his blood-stained jeans, which had been cut open at the hospital, as well as his blood-stained shoes, and the officer did decide to throw away these items. At this time, police were afraid that Anthony may have been involved in a much more serious crime just because of the way he looked, but they did not know just how bad it was yet. So by February 28th, the housekeeper returned back to the room with some fresh towels, but when she got back, she realized that nobody was in the room. So she knocked to see if anybody would open the door, but that is when she noticed that there was blood on the door handle. So when nobody answered the door, she used the master key to enter the room. And when she walked into the room, this is when she was faced with Michaela's lifeless body nude from the waist down, laying face down on the bed. Of course, she immediately called 911 to report that there had been a murder. So now I'm going to describe this scene as well as what the autopsy report found. It is very upsetting, but it paints a picture of a young woman who absolutely fought with her life with every single ounce of strength that she had. So like I said, her body was laying face down on the bed and she had one arm behind her back. Her body was partially covered by bedding and I don't know which half. It was obvious that Michaela had been brutally murdered after being stabbed numerous times. There were pillows scattered all across the room, but police were able to find blood spatter on a pillow that was located on a bed that was 10 to 12 feet away from Michaela's body. They found a broken lamp in this room as well as a syringe, and there was blood splatter all over the walls in this room. Then they found blood smears all over all of the door handles, which indicated to police that she had probably tried to escape the room as she was being attacked. Then as police were looking at the perimeter of the hotel, they basically found a bloody path that led them right to where Anthony had been arrested on the previous day with these carjacking charges. So they saw that there was blood on the fence that was behind the roadway in. They then found a bloody handprint on a car that was parked at a nearby sandwich shop near the roadway inn. I believe this might have been the Jimmy John's. But this led them to another car that was parked at the nearby car dealership just north of the hotel, which also had bloodstains on it. Of course, Michaela's body had been sent to the medical examiner for an autopsy. It came out that Michaela had been stabbed multiple times in her upper chest and her neck area. Her neck was cut so badly that it was nearly decapitated. In total, she had been stabbed over 120 times. The report said that there was a significant attempt to decapitate her head with a sharp weapon. She also had dozens of wounds on her arms and her hands, which indicated that she had been holding her hands up to defend herself against these multiple stabbings. She was also covered in bruises from literally head to toe as a result of the attack. It had also been stated that because of how hard she was fighting back, Anthony had ripped all of her fingernails off. So now going back to the housekeeper who had originally found Michaela's body, she reported to police that she had seen Anthony in the room with another man, but she didn't know who either of these men were. So police looked into who this room was registered to, and it turned out that none of them had put their names down for this room. The room was actually under the name of Chad Benefield. So police found out who this Chad guy was, and when they spoke to him, he admitted that he rented a room out to one of his friends who he only knew as Speedy. So he didn't know this man's first or last name. Police were then able to obtain security video from the motel, which showed a man that was leaving the room the night before the body was found. Police were then able to identify a Speedy as being Lionel White, 
who we discussed earlier as being in the room the previous night. They were able to track him down to another motel that he had been staying at, and then they arrested him two days later that following Saturday. When police arrested him, he was found to be in possession of a tool with a pointed shaft that was several inches long. So I don't know if this was the murder weapon or not, but it was some sort of weapon that he was found with. He was also found to be in possession of meth at the time. When he was taken in for questioning, he waived his rights to have a lawyer present and he agreed to speak with the detectives. He told them that he had been staying in the roadway inn with Anthony that night when Anthony's girl had joined them. He said that all three of them had been participating in drug use that night, but he said that Anthony and his girl, who was Michaela, had started arguing, so he left the room. He maintained that he did not participate in hurting her and that he didn't even know that she was dead until he was arrested. But obviously, police didn't buy it. He was literally seen putting bloody towels back out at this hotel room, so he was arrested and charged with second-degree murder as well as possession of a controlled substance. Then, at the time, police already had Anthony in jail because of these other carjackings charges. So at this time, Anthony was charged with second-degree murder and first-degree carjacking. Anthony had sat in jail for almost a year. He went to multiple hearings with the family attending every single one. All throughout these hearings, the family said that both him and Lionel just sat there and both of them had smiles on their faces and they were just laughing and joking every single time they saw them. Neither of them showed any remorse for what they did and their defense attorneys just kept making excuse after excuse to push back the hearings and the trial dates. The family made their own Justice for Lala shirts that they wore to these hearings. Like I mentioned earlier, Michaela's niece called her Lala, so it was sort of a special homage to her and her niece's close bond. I tried really hard to find more details about these hearings, but pretty much every article that was written about this was just very vague and had very short, you know, one to two sentence summaries about all of these hearings. All the information that I got about their behaviors came directly from the Justice for Michaela Facebook page. But either way, a year passed before Anthony stood in front of a judge and he accepted a plea deal. He accepted a plea of guilty to aggravated murder with a deadly weapon. This was in exchange for them dropping the carjacking charges. For this, Anthony was sentenced to 30 years in prison for the murder of 24-year-old Michaela Young. During the sentencing, Anthony faced the family and he apologized. He said, quote, I'm sorry for taking someone so special away from the people that love her. I feel awful for what I've done. There's not a day goes by and think about what I did. I'm sorry for the hurt and the pain that I caused because I look at the pictures on the shirts that you wear. I can't imagine the pain that you feel and I know sorry is not enough. I was just on drugs and I never imagined that I could have done something like this. I'm sorry for taking her away from you. I was just on drugs. That is quite the line, quite the excuse. Apparently, his excuse for murdering her that night was that he was on a mixture of meth and heroin, and I guess that just caused him to explode and act completely out of the ordinary and murder her. But beyond this, we don't really know a real motive. We don't know if they argued that night, what they argued about if they did. We don't know if he had a plan to kill her because, you know, he thought that she sent him to jail, like we mentioned earlier. All he said was that he was on drugs and he killed her. But the Young family was and is absolutely not satisfied with this sentencing. They felt that this sentencing was not sufficient for somebody who exhibited this level of careless brutality that he carried out on the night that Michaela was murdered. The family begged the judge to extend the sentencing, but his defense attorney and his family pointed to the fact that he was the product of poverty, drugs, and he had learning disabilities. Anthony's aunt had attended the trials and she went on to talk about how she always had known Anthony as a really nice man, except for when he was on drugs. She said, quote, without drugs, none of this would be here. Christy, Michaela's mother, responded with, don't tell me it's because you are high. My nightmares are filled with visions of my daughter trying to get away from this monster. She also said, I saw the autopsy report. I have so much rage and disgust. I thought you'd have remorse, but instead you bragged about it to other cellmates. His father also read his statement. He said, Kayla was in that room running from door to door, trying to get out, blood everywhere, begging for her life. 
Did she say, I want to go home to my dad? 30 years is not enough for such a horrible murder. This was one of the worst murders committed in the entire country last year. Because of this sentencing, he will be out in his 50s. So after this horrific and brutal murder, he gets to spend his 50s and beyond out and free doing whatever he wants. While Michaela didn't get to live past 24, it's unfair, it's unjust, and to just add to this, to add salt to the wound, Lionel White had pled guilty to lesser charges of possession, and he was actually released on time served, so he's a free man now. He doesn't have to face any punishment, even though he literally was seen placing bloody towels outside of the hotel room. I don't know the extent of his full involvement. I don't know if he helped with the murder or if he helped afterwards. Clearly, police didn't find a connection between Michaela's murder and this weapon that he was found with but clearly he knew something. He was clearly helping clean it up. So if that's not an accessory charge, then I don't know what is. The family said that they are absolutely exhausted from having to continuously fight for justice. They are frustrated that this justice system is built for the suspects, not the victims. The court had no problem talking about how Anthony just had the hardest life and that's why all of this happened, but no one wants to talk about the fact that he showed absolutely no remorse in the hearings before this took place. No one wants to talk about how he bragged about this murder to other cellmates. Nobody wants to talk about the struggles that Michaela faced in her life. Nobody wanted to talk about how Michaela's trusting and forgiving nature with the tendency to see the best in people put her in this position to be murdered and humiliated by Anthony. I unfortunately did not have access to any of the police documents or the autopsy reports, so I had to go solely off of the articles that were written about this case, but according to what Emily has come out to say, Anthony did everything in his power to humiliate Michaela, even down to the way that he positioned her body after murdering her. She also said that the extent of her injuries are just so much worse than any of us know just based on the articles that were written. I did try really hard to find other documents. I probably spent about two hours trying to find these other documents and the autopsy report, but I just couldn't find it. So even just knowing that, even knowing that they have said that these injuries that have been reported on aren't even as bad as it gets, that literally just puts a knot in my stomach. It's just incredibly disappointing that a man with such rage, such anger, and such violence in his heart will be out of prison in his 50s to walk free and do whatever he pleases. And who knows, if he stays on his best behaviors, he'll probably be out sooner than that because I agree with Michaela's family. The justice system is built to benefit the perpetrators. It's all under the idea that they should be rehabilitated and be given a second chance at life after they made some mistakes. Guess who doesn't get a second chance? Michaela. Her mistake was putting her trust in the wrong person, and she will never get a second chance for that mistake. It was robbed from her. These cases just frustrate me because having to see the excuse of having a hard life being used over and over and over again in these cases is just so annoying. Lots of people have hard lives. In fact, lots of people have much harder lives than Anthony. Plenty of people are born to drug-addicted parents, unfortunately, who jump from home to home in the foster care system, who are beaten along the way and fall into heavy drug use. But guess what? Most of them do not commit murder because most people don't feel entitled to someone else's life because mommy and daddy didn't raise them right. I have a lot of sympathy, an unbelievable amount of sympathy for people who go through such trauma and people who go through really awful things in their life, but when they use it as an excuse to take somebody else's life, that's when I no longer care. I no longer feel bad. Anthony did not choose his upbringing, but Anthony chose to do drugs. He chose to murder Michaela, and now he gets to walk free in his 50s. I am so, 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 so very sorry to Michaela's family. I can't even imagine the hole that they must feel when they have to do these family gatherings without her. Every time they have to celebrate birthdays, holidays, weddings, special events without her. I'm so, so sorry that they had to go to these trials and hearings and sit there and watch Anthony and Lionel laugh and have a jolly old time. I'm so, so sorry that Lionel is walking free. I'm so, so sorry that they had to sit there and see Anthony be told that he will be given a second chance in his 50s while Michaela gets nothing 
absolutely nothing. So if there's anything that you get from this case, please just share Michaela's story. Visit the Justice for Michaela Christine Young Facebook page and share your words of support. The family has been through so, so, so much and they are still fighting for real justice. But either way, that is where I'm going to end today's video. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and click the link down below and head over to Liquid IV and use code RACHELSHANNON25 for 25% off of your order. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!